everybody. Here's the OSINT Curious Webcast podcast with uh, this week a new special guest. Um, I'm your host for today, uh, Dutch Ocean Guy, also known as Nico. And let me first introduce our guest, Jan, Jan Texa. Maybe you could introduce yourself briefly. Hey, everybody. Uh, so I'm basically a recruiter who likes to write books and creating sourcing games for sources and recruiters. And I'm a huge Austin fan, uh, so I'm really great to be here and, you know, seeing all those people who writing those amazing articles. So I would like to thank you for that because, you know, even in quarantine, I can, I can spend lots of time to read those uh, manuals and articles. So thanks for that. It's better than Lion King that you discuss. <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you, thank you. Glad you could make it. It's an honor to have you on. Uh, Technizet, you're in, you're here. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is uh, Technizet. Um, I've been back from being gone for a while. Uh, I was on a short leave, but I'm slowly getting back into the ocean game again. So glad to be here, everyone. Yeah, good to have you back, Laurent. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Laurent, also known as Laurent. So I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. Okay, cool. And Matthias. So good evening, good morning, whatever, wherever you are. This is Matthias, also known as MW OSINT. Yay. And we have Ray. Hi, my name is Ray. I don't know what's going on with the video right now. There we go. Um, glad to be here. Okay, cool. And Nix. Hi everyone, it's Nick's Intel, but you can call me Nick's. It's great to be here and I uh, look forward to hearing more from Jan. Okay, cool. And lastly, but certainly not least, we have our own Sector 045. Yep, Sector here. Finally, I'm back too after being busy with work for weeks on end. Finally joining again. Hi everyone. Cool. So, um, well, let's get into, uh, well, let's get into our interview with Jan and I'm pretty excited because um, it's uh, a field for me specifically that has always had a certain interest because in essence, um, what you do, recruiting and uh, what well, people like to call it uh, sourcing, uh, in essence, it's OSINT, right? Yep. And, I, and I didn't even know until like, I think four or five years ago when I accidentally met someone at a conference who said to me, hey, I'm doing also uh, OSINT, but they call it sourcing, and that's where it got my traction. Can you tell me a little bit about your background? So I basically work as a recruiter for, it will be 15 years, and every single time I'm saying that, I'm feeling really old. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's more, it's more than 15 years, and I'm basically focused on IT recruitment. So everything that is connected with IT. And I'm also was a huge fan of, finding various files uh, in past and basically that's how I learned basic uh, the boolean operators uh, the logic behind it and uh, and I'm applying basically the same things uh, when I'm searching for the candidates and uh, recently it's more about discovering the email addresses finding the other sources uh, of uh, or other sites social sites that those candidates have so we can track their phone numbers emails and other ways how we can contact them. And especially in IT, you know, it's really crazy how, uh, you know, lots of companies are looking for developers. So I did lots of tests during the year and I found out that if a developer in San Francisco is looking for a job, they are getting around 39, 37 uh, offers per week. If they are not looking for a job, it's 27 or 25. I did a few wow. tests based on that. So as you can see, if developers are getting email, lots of emails like that, you need to find different way. And the best way is to find the phone number or email so you can uh, reach them directly and not just as every, uh, every other recruiter through email. But, yeah. so, so a question for me, because you just told me, um, uh, well, person in San Francisco gets on average uh, between uh, 20 and 40 messages. Yep. Um, how do you prevent from being annoying <laughs> that's become because th that's my that's my initial thought when when i when i'm having a job and i'm enjoying my job and i every now and then i get the same things not that much it says something probably about my skills i'm having doubts now but can you tell me how you the tactics or are there uh, ethics involved 
Well, you know that the recruiters are annoying, right? So <laughs> how do not to be annoying? It's very simple. You need to spend the time and read uh, the profile of that candidate. It's not like, hey, I see that you have Java, so maybe you also have JavaScript knowledge. Here is the offer. Uh, no, you need to read it. You need to do some, not background check, but little bit, learn a little bit more about that person. You, uh, like every single person has Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you can use all that knowledge and create a tailored message to that specific candidate. And uh, lots of uh, recruiters are doing the same mistake that they are starting their message. Hey, uh, Tim, I read your profile and I'm working as a recruiter in that company and we are looking for this and that. Every single recruiter is doing that. Uh, they are just spamming and, you know, it's, it's called uh, spay, uh, spray and pray. Basically, they send 100 people and they are waiting for the response. But the, so that's that's um, not targeted, in my oh, it, No, it's not targeted. It's basically like, you know, just, you know, just spamming. But when you spend the time and create a tailored message to that specific candidate with the information about them and about what they are doing, and it's the message is about them, that not, it's not about you or, or that you are looking for some, uh, some candidate or you need help. No, you need to create a message that is tailored to that specific person. That you're looking for me. Really. Yeah, I'm looking for specifically for, for yeah. you. And, and yeah. I will be tailoring the message based on your profile with some other things that you can, for example, mention in, uh, on your Twitter. So if you are a huge fan of something, I can use that because you are probably tweeting about that quite often. So um, uh, immediately, I'm I'm thinking about GDPR and that, that was going to be my question. Yeah. Okay. Go for it, Matthias. Go for it. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, you you mentioned that you go on to Facebook and Twitter and you try to find phone numbers. So you basically drop cold calls. Um, have have things really changed in the the post GDPR era than before? Um, how is it more challenging for you now? Well, it's more challenging because lots of companies and sites, they basically hide all the information, the profile pages, uh, emails, and everything. So it's, it's more challenging, but there are so many other ways and there are uh, Chrome plugins that, uh, you know, we as a sources and recruiters can use. So when I, if I'm going to use those Chrome plugins and visit your LinkedIn profile, I can get your email address. Uh, they are always saying that it's from uh, public sources. I personally don't believe it's from public sources. I've got a few other theories about that, but uh, yes, it's, it's uh, after GDPR, it's harder, but more rec uh, recruiters are using their own databases more because we, uh, we as a recruiters, we are using the application tracking systems or CRM systems, and we have thousands and thousands of candidates during the years there. So we are now forced to go there, find the profile or the specific person who, who is uh, matching our expectation and also double check their profile on LinkedIn and see what is the difference with, uh, for example, that person was working as a developer three years ago and now is a senior developer. So I can double check those information through various sites like LinkedIn, GitHub, or any profile pages that the person mentioned somewhere and they are reachable uh, through Google. So it's more like detective work sometime, but uh, you know, I'm focusing a little bit more on targeting specific candidate and finding the specific person, not uh, like I just want to have one developer and I'm going to contact 27 people or 200 people or you know, thousands. I'm looking for specific person with specific skills. And I'm always starting on LinkedIn, definitely. But the GDPR is playing the role. I can collect or, uh, or save all those information in my system uh, like without the approval of the candidate. So that's definitely the hard part. Can I also quickly ask you something about uh, social engineering? So to what extent do you use social engineering? So for instance, if you want to know, for instance, who the line manager is, because you want to get in contact with the line manager, phone number or email address. Um, yeah, can you tell us a little yeah, bit? So it's basically called, uh, it's, uh, it's like beating the gatekeeper. Gatekeeper is usually the, the office manager or office admin assistant who is basically reconnecting your calls. Uh, there are a few ways how you can do that. Uh, sometimes you are just calling that person like, hey, I just trying to reach out, I don't know, uh, Joe 
and Joe is working as a developer. Uh, or uh, you can also try different numbers from that company range because you can find very easily the company range, uh, the phone numbers, um, or the range of phone numbers on the internet. So you can see and try and basically try to call those people and get the information. But I personally don't use the social engineering because I, I believe that's not the right thing to do, especially when you try to build the, when you try to build some kind of trust between you and the candidate. But uh, my phone now, well, for the company I work for, that one number is mentioned on the website and every single person is calling me. So I, it's not calling to anybody else, it, they are calling me. So I heard so many stories during the years, oh, or, you know, wife, uh, mistress, lost child, um, somebody lost documents or, or, or like government ID and they would like to return it. So many things like that. So I know that recruiters and especially headhunters are using that type of strategy to get the information and collect the information uh, through phone. I personally believe that you can find almost everything uh, through uh, Google because the information are accessible somewhere. Very interesting, very interesting. So, um, when listening to you, you um, well, nine out of ten times, I interpreted that you go to places where people advertise themselves professionally. So LinkedIn, GitHub, and since you are an IT, those yep. should are probably your number one and number two places to go. Um, are there any plat platforms or social media platforms with, which are really specific for sources uh, besides those two? Not um, meaning the large social media, which we all know. So, so you mean like uh, where you can find sourcers? No, where you can find uh, people to target, where you find people. Where do you find people? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, you can find them everywhere. Uh, it's basically uh, Airbnb. Uh, the people are also mentioning uh, their uh, jobs uh, titles in their bios. So any site that is, uh, that is basically connected with some profile, where you can put the information about what you are doing, your job title, location, etc. You can use that. And uh, I've wrote many articles about uh, like Airbnb, uh, Couchsurfing, um, you know, Facebook. You can go and source uh, X-ray, basically run X-ray searches for Facebook. Uh, there are dozens and dozens, or not dozens, like millions of people who are mentioning their job titles. Uh, there and you can easily find them, you know, through Google. That's, you know, that's the easiest way what you can do. Really interesting. So, um, one question we always ask our guests, what is something you really want to learn in the coming years, days, maybe during COVID? Uh, well, different language. <laughs> it will be probably uh, something, you know, um, Different language, definitely, because it will help you to understand uh, the different markets. For me personally, I really would like to understand the Japanese market a little bit more and the Chinese market because they've got a very spe uh, there are differences, lots of differences, uh, how their markets are working. Mm -hmm. So that will be probably that one. And if it's just something from IT, then scraping uh, scraping with the Python because um, you know I see that. Uh, lots of sources are learning Python to scrape the data and generate the, some kind of result and it's uh, helping them to speed up the searching process. So basically you just scrape something uh, uh, or scrape profiles and find the people way faster. So. Uh, yeah, 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 I can understand that. Um, so I think if and not anyone has any questions anymore. We will move on to the news. Or I see hands raises. Yeah, go for oh, it. Yeah, yeah. No, just just one more. Oh, yes. Um, if you had to rank like the the hardest countries to find people in, um, <laughs> what, what would that be? You know, let, leaving like the Asian countries, Japan and China, out because if you have the language barrier. But let's say you know in Europe or Northern America, wh where would it be hardest to find someone? in your job? Well, uh, it's more connected with what kind of roles you are looking for, what kind of skill set. Um, uh, I 
So I, I personally believe that if you are a good recruiter and sourcer, you can find candidate, candidates almost everywhere. Uh, the hardest part is that if, for example, if you are working for some agency, a recruitment agency, and they've got uh, some, I don't know, job, they need to find some candidate in the, some small village. So you can find the candidate, but you will need to also convince them to move to that small city, small village. And that's probably the hardest part because through LinkedIn, you can find almost every single person that you're looking for, but convince them to move to that place or work for that company, that's the hardest part. And I just wanted to ask, as a recruiter, how, how many hours of the day would you say you're doing OSINT related stuff? Is it most of the day? Well, you mean uh, what we call sourcing and we feel like yes. special? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, absolutely no. I, uh, well, for m my role is leading the team. So I'm more focusing on leading the team, helping, uh, you know, solve the problems and find candidates is just a short or oh, small part of my job. Uh, I, but I spend lots of my free time uh, doing OSINT or sourcing because I'm trying to understand how uh, some sites changing their system, they are adding, uh, you know, uh, no index um, uh, meta tags. So I can't go through those sites through, uh, or, uh, through Google. So I spend lots of lots of time uh, to breaking lots of sites and trying to understand how those sites are working and uh, trying to create uh, various Boolean search string uh, just to understand uh, how I can create more effective ways how to find the people. So it's, you know, for me it's a hobby and, um, you know, as I spending so much time with writing the books, I also collecting lots of data for books, uh, on, uh, for articles, for trainings. So I don't know, somebody spending time and doing painting, I'm basically doing OSIN or sourcing. So. So you, you also have the sourcing games, um, yep. something that you mentioned before. Uh, just really interested how you started that and what was the initial intention? Because, I mean, if people don't know that, and Jan will probably explain that, but that's like an awesome place to train your, your OSIN skills and, and kind of a capture the flag way. So uh, I basically start in that way that uh, uh, I don't believe that, uh, oh, yeah, that is it. <laughs> So I basically start with the way that I would like to test the knowledge of uh, the people that I work with and also um, my friends. Uh, because every single person, if you ask sourcer, hey, are you good? Do you know uh, how the sourcing is working? Do you know those, all those methods? The people will always going to tell you, yes, we know. Uh, and, and I'm really good in that. But in the reality, there is a difference. So I create, it's, I, it's basically based on scavenger hunts. When you go to, uh, you, you've got one task, when you solve it, you've got a second task, when you solve it, and et cetera, et cetera. And I created it for, you know, my friends, and uh, it, you know, and I just published it, and the first, I believe, I believe first month, almost like 15,000 people played it, or just some crazy number. Uh, oh, so far, it's more than 100, or almost like 200,000 people uh, across the globe. Uh, lots of sources, recruiters, developers. Uh, I know um, what I heard, and I'm not sure that some some government agencies are also uh, using it for uh, uh, as a uh, you know as a playground for their employees. Uh, hopefully, the good ones. <laughs> uh, but it's just fun, you know. I, I believe that. Uh, the, the whole community, uh, not only sourcing, but also is, they gave me so much. So this is the way how I, how I would like to repay and give something back because, uh, you know, I'm using lots of inf uh, information and knowledge from others. Uh, so I'm trying to give a little bit back uh, and, you know, sourcing games became that channel <laughs> uh, to giving back. Well, yeah, and that's what it's all about, right? We, yep. What we do here, we share. And I really enjoyed sourcing games. We will put a link into the show notes for people interested so they can uh, take the test. Um, for now, I want to thank you for your time. Please hang around and uh, yep. participate in, uh, in how we expand on the news. Um, let me briefly show where people can find you. They can find you here at your Twitter account, uh, Young. Texte, and correct me if I don't uh, pronounce it right, but the, the in Dutch is pretty cool. Um, 
And they can also uh, look for your book, on, and it's coming soon on Amazon. I see. Yeah, we, it, it will be it will be out like within two months plus minus, and that will be the new one. Uh, I put my first two books together, completely rewrite them, and uh, add like sixty or seventy percent more content. So. Wow, awesome. That's uh, pretty cool. I need to get myself a copy. Um, well, on to the news, I guess. Um, first off, I wanted to uh, go into our new blog by uh, our very own Technoset, and maybe um, she can tell us a little bit why this is so important, and it correlates to what you were doing, Jan. Well, I get, like, almost on a daily basis about maybe five messages of people asking if I know any OSINT related jobs. And I know a lot of us get that question a lot. And well, I will always say to them, well, yes, I know them, but like, where do you live? And do you want to be in the public or in the private sector? And what are you aiming for? What is your skill set? And I decided it would be time to write a blog about it because then Everybody can take their time, just read it. Um, especially the fact that OSINT has been uh, done by a lot of people in a lot of different fields. For instance, I didn't know until like last, I think it was last year when I noticed that recruitment calls OSINT sourcing or x-raying. Uh, I was at the... Um, a big uh, convention in Amsterdam and I was invited to speak there and I learned so much from all the recruitment how to do scraping how to search for people and and they started to talk about all of these different kinds of fields where people are doing the same thing like OSINT and sourcing but they're not actually calling it that so for instance a fact checker or somebody who does brand protection, they need to search for people too. Skip tracing, bounty hunter, hunters, they all do a form of OSINT, but they don't call it OSINT. So maybe you're looking for an OSINT job and looking for OSINT vacancies or OSINT jobs on Google, but this will probably not get you the job you're looking for. So hopefully the blog will help people find the right words to use in their searches. Yeah. Yeah, really cool write-up. It was really interesting for me. And a little help from Jan also in there. Yes. So, yeah, worth reading. So, how to land a job in OSINT. And we will, of course, put a link into the show notes. And I'm trying to build some correlations here in our news because uh, we have our own Wondersmith who uh, made a wonderful blog, How to Train Yourself to Be an Analytical Thinker. And I think, well, if you're looking for a job, this is certainly a skill you need. Can you tell us a little bit more about your uh, hunt on this uh, one, Smith? Sure. So when I'm writing a blog, I'm looking at it from like a new person into the field perspective because I'm relatively new. So I'm trying to think of like where, what is a barrier for someone who is trying to enter? And myself, I see a lot of people posting tools and like what they're researching. And I think like, how do they come up with this stuff? It's so smart. And, and so I wanted to kind of investigate methods for coming up with new ideas, um, working through stuff that I am working on myself, um, how to get information out of data and, and present it. So that was kind of my, my idea while writing this. So I wanted to go into like the, the five W's, who, what, when, where, why, um, how to get clues from the data, how to focus it so you're not just like wildly uh, searching for hours um, without any focus. Um, yeah, so that was yeah, really cool. the, the method. Really cool. And you also shared uh, a link to this one to us to discuss because there was a document about um, how uh, cases in intelligence analysis and structure techniques, uh, this was a good read or something? I didn't read it. Yeah, Jay Krebs posted this as a comment to my blog post, and I've started to go through it. It's it's like real life cases, like crime cases, and then how you investigate through it. 
Ah, interesting. And it, I found it really interesting. Yeah, sounds really interesting. And so, uh, well, we'll check it out. Also, of course, uh, links into the show notes. Um, well, shifting from um, thinking analytical and learning how to land a job and, and how to be sourcing, uh, our very own Nick uh, wrote a nice, very nice article about the secret life of JPEGs. Uh, care to elaborate a little bit on this? Yeah, this is um, something I've been thinking about for a while, but um, in our last webcast, we discussed um, about sort of fake AI generated images and how Facebook recognizes them. And I started to dig in a little bit more into the actual structure of JPEGs themselves. Because we all know, right, that um, in the perfect world, when you do your OSINT course or you read an OSINT book, they tell you, tell you about EXIF data and how you can find geolocation information in there and device information. But we know from the reality of doing OSINT on the web is that information is almost always removed, right? It's quite rare on any platform to find anything useful. Um, but I had thought, well, you know, we can do a little bit of digital forensics and we can dig into JPEGs and see like what information is there. We know the EXIF is usually removed, but there are these little traces and it's just kind of a bit of a thought experiment. And actually even on some of the big platforms like uh, Facebook and Twitter, they have their own, particular way of removing EXIF data and they add their own data in in case of Facebook which helps you tie an image to Facebook. Twitter for example left in um, it leaves in sort of the device if it's an Apple device it leaves the device type and a rough you can infer the rough age of the device from there so normally I think people think well EXIF data is not there so there's no point right in digging into what the actual makeup of this image but there is a little bit of stuff there um, if you're willing to dig into it a little bit. Yeah, I really enjoyed reading this one. There was a lot of um, gems that I um, forgot about. So the, it's it's really worthwhile to read it and, and get your mind going like, ah, oh, oh yeah, I forgot about that one. Yeah, really interesting. So yeah, good write-up. Um, I discovered this one. I don't know if you pick, you people picked this up, but this was a, a, a tweet by The Hacker's Life, and uh, they had... Um, some great, uh, well, um, curated lists about APIs, so basic APIs to play around with. And what I found particularly interesting, because last week and the weeks before, always we talk about people wanting to learn Python and wanting to learn how to scrape information using Python and APIs. So this has a great write-up how to get started with APIs and to gather data, and you can use that curated list to get some inspiration or just to get the hang out of it, how to scrape information through APIs. And once you get familiarized with this, with coding uh, an API, uh, Python API code, you can go and pick your own API uh, of interest. So I found it really interesting to uh, you know, just play around with it. And well, just I think about an hour ago, Laurent uh, came in and he said, well, I just played around with something that might be the new Python, and it's called uh, Julia. Would you care to talk a little bit about this one, Laurent? Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, um, I found a very interesting blog post, which is called Why Python is Not the Pro Programming, Programming Language of the Future. Um, we also put um, the link in the show notes, and it basically talks about why Python is so popular and why it has become so popular. But then it also talks about one of the downsides of uh, Python, which is that it's, it's speed, it's not that fast. And then it's uh, at the end of the article, so it goes to like a lot of technical details. It lists a couple of new program, programming languages, which, uh, one of which is Julia, a very new language uh, that competes head on with Python. And uh, I mean, the, what you can see on, um, on uh, uh, Nico's um, <clears throat> screen is the, the official documentation of Julia. And you can also have a look at how fast it is. Um, I also played around with it today. So there's a really good website called uh, juliaacademy.com. So this is linked. To, if you click on learning resources, it will lead you to the Julia Academy. And then you can take free courses. Uh, the first free course is getting started with Julia. Uh, it basically shows you how to download the environment and everything, and then gives you an introduction to the language. Uh, but I think one of the things that um, might be interesting to some of the listeners, if you are if you're not sure if you should learn Python or not, or you just want to learn, get into some programming, this might be something to look at, um, especially if you work with uh, big data. So 
here in this case, I mean, if you use Python to just simply scrape something, I'm, I'm sure um, Julia can do the same. Um, but when it comes to big data, data science, visualizing um, data in a fast way, I think Julia is what the experts say uh, is pretty, pretty powerful and something to watch. And also in another article that I read, it was also saying that Python, obviously, I mean, the whole ecosystem around Python has been established, established with uh, thousands, I don't know exactly how many uh, people um, work, on, work with Python and develop amazing stuff. So this, you, you, won't be, uh, you won't get rid of this in the near future. Uh, but still something uh, to look at, Julia, a new programming language. It's not that new. It was developed a couple of years ago, but now it's also taking uh, slowly <clears throat> uh, off the ground. And I think uh, this is definitely something to look at. Julia. Yeah, looks uh, looks promising. I uh, definitely will check this one out. Yeah, uh, thanks for so, sharing. So now, now you gave me an excuse to kind of skip Python and wait until there's like a Julia for idiots. Uh, <laughs> I, was I really the haven't same found thing. the time to do really intense Python courses. So yeah, that's my excuse from no, now on. But, but that's a really good point. And I, I was also thinking about this. So why should I learn this? Because obviously I've got so much else to do, but still I, I love programming. I love to just play around with these things. But I think for from an OSINT perspective, I mean, if you look at all the packages and libraries, and, and well, of, and never bet on one horse, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But also, I mean, uh, for for web scraping, you've got all these beautiful soup libraries and all kinds of packages, which I think uh, at the moment are missing with Julia. I'm sure you can scrape, um, but uh, I would have to go really deep into the um, into the whole thing. Yeah. Well, something to dig into in the coming weeks, since we are all at home. Um, well, next up, I found this a really interesting thread by uh, Thomas, a um, Dutch guy who works at Pointer, and Pointer does online investigations. Um, there is some, um, there's a little bit of um, a risk in here because there is sensitive content in here, but I found it really interesting to see how he um, figured out in during a thread how a certain disinformation is being spread. So really worthwhile to look it out. Really, well, it's fairly simple. It's like a thread of 10 or 12 tweets and he takes you by the hand and tells you how he uh, dissects it and labels it as disinformation and not related to COVID at all. So uh, worthwhile of checking out Thomas Pointer. Um, Was this the one where they also had some, some like reverse image searching and stuff like that? Yes. So they also used a lot of different OSINT techniques? Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of techniques. It's like 10 tweets or something, but a lot of techniques are in there. And Thomas, I know he's really good at uh, reverse image searching and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, and a very nice guy. Um, more COVID news because we can't get away from it yet. Uh, OSINT combined, Chris, uh, who was our guest last week, uh, made a free new tool which you can help uh, at least keep track of uh, trusted sources and trusted information surrounding um, uh, the coronavirus. So uh, it's a really interesting app. Once you, once you fire it up, you get a map, uh, a heat map on where things are, uh, sources, and you can toggle between Australia, United States, and Kingdom, and United Kingdom. So we need more countries, Chris. We are we do we are also alive. We need to know what's going on in our countries. So, but uh, yeah, it's really worthwhile. So please check it out. Um, then I want to switch to another game because then we have the sourcing game. But um, Aware Online, Bram, made uh, a great uh, quiz. Uh, and I think it was you, Matthias, who put it in our show notes. Would you tell us? Would you tell us a little bit more about that? No, it's just that, that I saw that there was this, this little quiz, and it's, it's mainly around, you know, OPSEC and IT security, at least the first chapter. Um, and, and from what I understood, there are going to be more quizzes to come. And if I recall right, Sector is actually leading the board, so he was, you know, at all answers right and at the fastest time. Um, I'm, I unfortunately was not that good, so I didn't, you know, put my name down because I had two or three uh, wrong answers. You know, I, I, I didn't want to look bad in front of you guys. Um, but just in general, a, a good starting point to, you know, just go through this quiz and just use it to learn yourself when it comes to OPSEC and, you know, which, which measures you should take before um, getting online and doing your research. It's not specifically stated like that, but th this is a quiz where you can actually learn something. So, so really interesting. But maybe Sector would like to say something since he's like a at the top of the list or at least give hints <laughs> yeah well um it and it security is of course my uh, speciality so it wasn't too difficult for me but there were some very tricky 
scenes in there. Um, Brum also, uh, aware online, also got the question like, okay, but can we also review the questions and can we see where, what answers were wrong? And he was thinking about maybe doing something for that. So um, you can actually check out uh, where you can improve. But uh, it's, it's a really good little quiz, uh, purely about OPSEC. And it talks about uh, Tor routers, what your browser leaves, uh, what kind of digital footprints you leave online, and everything like that. Uh, really challenging, pretty difficult, but uh, really fun to do. And uh, as Matthias already said, more topics are coming up whenever he has time to uh, to write it. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's uh, pretty busy uh, lately. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, uh, Matthias, um, um, you so uh, because I really didn't have time to look at this one. I had a really busy week. You can you please tell me why you put this in to discuss? So this is a, a, a pretty neat blog article by the, the, the French OSINT organization, Open Facto. And uh, if, if I recall right, it kind of started, or they did like this, this joint project with BBC Africa Eye, and it was about uh, illegal weapons uh, trade to Libya, mainly from Turkey. Um, so the beginning of this month, there was reporting from BBC Africa and uh, Open Facto was also involved in there and they put out a nice blog article um, which basically shows um, weapons trafficking from Turkey to Libya but it, it crosses just so many different OSINT fields so if, if you look into this you'll see reverse image searching you'll see uh, SOCMINT so Twitter and Facebook um, you'll see some geoint trying to geolocate things um, you'll see something uh, related to maritime OSINT so basically AIS tracking of ships and trying to figure out uh, where they are and I just thought it was once more another really good example, a really case, uh, a really good case of how you can use all these different assets um, to get a nice package together. Um, so yeah, just you know, it, the, the the article will be in the show notes and something that is really nice to read because it's an interesting story. Um, yeah, really interesting story how you know Turkey is bypassing all these these embargoes and just all the different uh, types of intelligence collection they use and, and to put that together is, is a really good example as well. So that's, that's why I put it in here. Yeah. Um, so just have a look at it and uh, yeah, be, sure be amazed will. of what was going on there. I was thinking I would get bored during uh, the coronavirus stay at home stuff, but until now I'm, I'm, I need more time, people. I just need more time. So, uh, yeah, the, um, <laughs> by the way, uh, the Open Facto is indeed a collaboration. A couple of people that we all know. Um, Aliom Loy from BBC Africa is in there. Capteur Ouvert is in there. Yeah. And Hervé, but I forgot his Twitter name. So H -H -P, so HP something. HP Yeah. HP yeah. 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 Uh, so really good people and uh, quality content. Absolutely. And, and I'm you know, happy that they put that out in English because they do a lot of blog articles in French. Um, yeah. But it's, when it gets too technical, it's it's harder for me to read that. So I'm really happy when they put out English content there. But even though their their French content is amazing as well. So if you can read French, if you can understand French, that's also a go-to source of, of good OSINT information. Yeah, yeah and they are one of the, uh, if I recall, correctly one of the few um organizations that also give training in french and also so that was at, very difficult to come by that's why i also started open for and also just to add to it because i saw it early on twitter and um, they also released released a new startup me dashboard and um, because they have been also heavily yes. involved in the whole covid 19 misinformation disinformation research um mm. so that's also something to look at Mm, interesting. So, uh, Matthias, don't unmute, unmute yourself again, because this is something that uh, was for me again, because, you know, um, I love talking about operation security. And, um, well, this is basically for me, again, uh, proof why operation security is so important. Know your adversaries, but also know your tools. Could you please tell us a little bit uh, how, well, I'm more interested um as an initial question um you started digging into this uh is there a reason why you look looked into this or do you 
always look into the tools you use? Um, so in general, I, I always try to look into the things that I use. Um, as I stated in the article, if something new pops up, um, I, I try to vet that as good as possible with, with my capabilities. And one of the first things that I always do, if a platform pops up, a website that I might want to use or something like that, I try to figure out, you know, who's behind it? Who, who's running this? That, that's the initial question. Not, not even going into defer to, to like um, basically to de decompiling code and, and looking into network traffic because I can't do that. So just to want to point out that I, I wrote this nice story here, but most of the work done in there was not me. It was just other people that had, you know, much greater skills than I do when it comes to all the technical aspects. But the way it started is that this product, Lampire, showed up, and it's it's a pretty good product. Um, I, yeah, I have I, to say that. I, I, I really liked it when I looked at it. And since I liked it so much and I, I knew I would probably use it, then I really was skeptical because I had never heard of that before. There was no, no traces, no links, and they just popped out out of nowhere. Yeah. So that's when I started asking questions. And I, I actually me emailed back and forth with them a couple times. I'm like, so, hey, wh who, are you, who are you? Where are you from? You know, what's a beer background? And all I got was evasive answers. Like, oh, yeah, we're, we're starting this new company. And they couldn't even say which country they're from. So, so to me, being a curious but skeptical person, that's kind of a red flag. I mean, yeah. If you don't want to be honest and you don't want to be open in the open source uh, community or open source intelligence community, that, that's, a, that's a big issue. Yeah. Um, so then I kind of forgot about it. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to use that and I don't really care. And at the beginning of this year, um, I noticed that a lot of people in, in our area of expertise were using Lampire, successfully using Lampire. And other people um, actually also figured out that there's something sketchy about that. And so we kind of teamed up um, and started looking into it and digging into it and, and found out that it actually is not a Hungarian company. At least, well, it's a Hungarian front company, um, but the tool itself was mostly developed by people that were or are employed by a Russian company called Norsi Trans, and that company solely provides Russian government intel with products. Um, so again, the, the absolute biggest red flag you can have. Um, so to me, after doing this investigation and, and looking into this with others, um, I, I was reassured in my opinion that I would not use this tool due to the, the backlinks with yeah. Russia. And Which is a shame it, because it is a good tool. Yeah, it does yeah. what it does. But. And, and one of the, the biggest concerns I have here is that I, I don't know if any of the traffic is, is forwarded back to Russia. I, I can't tell that. Um, but Russia has a mandatory in, uh, decryption. So that, again, is another security issue. So I do not want to put sensitive data in there, no matter how good the tool is. Yeah. Um, and if this is just a, a joint venture, if this is a front company for a Russian uh, company, if this is some, some rogue developers going off and doing their own thing, to me, it didn't really matter because there were these links. Yeah, and, and they I, weren't transparent, right? Hmm? And they weren't transparent at all. They weren't transparent, and the answers that I have received so far, um, some of them were published publicly, but yeah. I also had people reach out to me, um, and basically the people that reached out to me that are probably working for the company or whatever, they, they basically said, yeah, everything you found is basically right. Yeah. So that well, was also very interesting as well that you've had investigations and in, in our line of work with the investigations, we never really know if it's true. Right. I mean, there's there's always yeah. this this doubt that you might have. Um, so this was kind of rewarding for for the team that we had together to, to hear firsthand from, let's call them some of the, the key witnesses that said, oh, yeah, the stuff you found. That's true. That's right. Uh, yeah. for, for the most part of it. So that was quite cool as well. What I find particularly interesting, because um, we all know that um, some former intelligence people might uh, set up their own companies and, and make these pieces of software themselves, which doesn't immediately make them uh, malicious or bad actors, right? Because even when you're from Russia or you're from China, you can make perfectly good software, which can be used by everyone, um, as long as you are transparent on the code and your intentions or at least in my opinion, but this yep. could st is, would still be something. For me, this article was uh, more about being aware of what you install in your machine. And, and with that, I also um, um, 
want to discuss the installation of Firefox add-ons or Chrome extensions. People just randomly install those. I see people who have hundreds of those, but do you ever check their traffic? Do you ever check who owns it? Do you ever check uh, what information gets sent or isn't encrypted sent? So if I thank you for making us aware again. If I can mention one thing, when you mentioned the Chrome extension, I believe that's the problem in recruitment. A lot of those Chrome extensions are basically scraping everything what you do and sending those data somewhere else. And I test a few of those, and they basically scrape my, my fake profiles and put them into the database when I try to you know, visit them and try to get the email. So I believe that the Chrome extensions are going to be a huge problem in the future, especially for us sourcers too. Yeah, yeah, that's a risk. As long as you're aware, right? And that's all what, what operation security is about. It's yep. about being aware and before you start, think of your threats and the attack plans and that you might have in place. One last um, remark on that, yeah. just just to make this clear, because I, I, I received a lot of heat for this article. Um, yeah, my my okay, inbox thanks. was full. Um, and I, I think, Nico, you, you put it best is it's about transparency. So just to put this out there, this is no Russophobia or anything like that. If it would have been a former NSA employee who chose to, you know, not disclose where he used to work and not disclose what he actually did in the past to a certain extent, I would have had the same amount of skepticism. Um, yeah. It's, it's not about you know, where you come from in the past, it's how you deal with your past. I think that's the most important thing. And being in an open source intelligence community, I think we should be transparent and open. That, that's the main message here. Yeah, and I think, especially when you're aiming your product uh, towards people like us, you can expect people to look into your tools, right? Because that's what we do. We are curious. We like to figure out stuff. So basically you're asking for it when you're launching, when you're launching software. So, well, that being said, let's sum it up. No phobia for any country or whatever. It's just us being curious and asking questions about the tools we install on our machines with our, with our sensitive research cases, with which also have maybe um, compromised lives. So I want to and and as that. somebody who's written a few blogs on Lampier and used it at a hobby level, I wasn't very thrilled with their transparency or lack of transparency either. Yeah, yeah. So um, well, we're about uh, at the end of the hour. I wanted to really briefly point out that our very own Redo made a, a, a very nice short blog on what you um, well some basic tips how to find uh, profile IDs or a, to find information about Facebook, how to find some additional information about pages and groups, and how to save uh, videos or uh, pictures from Facebook. And she also made a complimentary 10 minute tip. So for those who are interested in some basic skill levels, how to gather information from Facebook, check it out. We will put it in our show notes. And um, well, I want to briefly point people towards, because I think it's really important to uh, the missing persons uh, uh, global CTF by Trace Labs on the 11th of April. Uh, I really wanted to be there as a judge or something, but time zone wise, I just cannot make it happen this time. Hopefully next time, because it would really be cool to join on that level, but I can only encourage people to join this. Can I really add important. something? Yeah, um, for sure. So the, the really exciting thing about this one is that they have just added, for Tiger King fans on Netflix, they have added the search for Carol Baskin's husband Ooh, to this. Really cool. So, I'm looking forward to this Don't one. tell me anything. I just started watching two <laughs> episodes. Like, what is the fuss about? And I'm completely cut It was out, a podcast. So it was a podcast first. first. Episode you're going to see. It, yeah. I haven't seen the podcast. It just started with the Netflix show. Should I do the podcast first? <laughs> no. uh, they're, they're pretty much the same. You get the okay. visuals with, with the Netflix show. So okay. does that mean that everyone that participates in the, the CTF has to watch the Netflix thing first? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> you this have is like to advertising watch I mean, for Netflix? You have but to you watch anyway. watched everything on Netflix, right? You just switched <laughs> to Disney. You said so yourself. <laughs> yeah, but I, I didn't want to look into this, this gunslinging, weird Texan tiger dude so far. That was like way too crazy, but I've heard yeah. good things. <laughs> awesome. The podcast was good too. It was uh, Over My Dead Body. Yeah. 
Oh, really? Cool. I'll add it to my podcast so, list. Some new series get added to the list, and people should really join the Trace Labs Missing Person CTF. Uh, I want to point out that we are doing Ocean Curious lunches or breakfast or dinners, depending on your time zone. So for pe people attending now, uh, stay tuned. Uh, on our Twitter account, we will announce our next lunch or breakfast or dinner, whatever you would like to call it, is just casually hanging out with us uh, or some people from the board and we, uh, you can join us and we will put your mic on if you want to and you can put your video on if you want to and just have lunch with us and discuss things like uh, the tiger stuff and uh, basically hang out and have fun. So um, and, and we're going to have a virtual pub quiz in one of them as well. Oh, and yeah, an, yeah. An OSINT yeah. quiz, you know, test your skills. <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. And we are trying to do um, different lunches in different time zones so everybody can participate. So last time we had, like, er almost every country represented except uh, Iceland, right, Matthias? We are still waiting for one country to join, right? So, so we had we had North America, we had Europe, we had Africa, we had Asia. Um, I I think we had South America as well in the last one, but I'm not really sure about that. And so so far, we're still lacking Australia and Antarctica. I mean, if we get someone from Antarctica, that'd be awesome, <laughs> which I don't see happening. But you know, Australia, <laughs> join us, and, and then we have you know the, the most populated continents. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, it would be really awesome. So um, we're about at the end of the show. Uh, I want to give Jan uh, the, the opportunity to do some shameless self-promoting. So if you have anything to say to promote, now your time. Nope, I, I, I don't like to promote myself, so thank you, but no. Well, then I will do it. Uh, go check out the book Full Stack Recruiter and the Sourcing Games website. Um, as for myself, uh, Mike and I are currently doing uh, some cybercash training. So the coming months. So if you want to uh, learn open source intelligence, um, go check it out on the sans.org website. And well, again, stay tuned for those ocean current lunches. Uh, Technoset, anything? Well, one of the reasons why I have been quiet for a couple of months now is that my new website is almost finished. So I'm going to be moving away from the start.me. It's going to be a little bit the same, but you have better search options. So keep watching me for the next probably two weeks. Hopefully I'll be live in two weeks. Oh, awesome. Pretty cool. Looking forward to that one because I always have a hard time finding the link which I, from which I know that's there. And I know yes. how to CTRLF, but I still won't find it. I had I have the same problem because I gathered so many links over the last couple of years and I've been adding them to the startup me, but sometimes I put a description in there, just some hints and tips on how to search or what kind of data is in a specific database but I don't know the title or the URL of the site. So I know what I put in the description. I want to search for the description only. And that's yeah. something Startup Me doesn't offer. So I decided to have it built for me. So awesome. it's almost finished. So uh, stay tuned for the new revamp yes. at Laurent, yes. do you have anything to promote, shout out, or whatever? Uh, not at this point. I'm working on a couple of things in the background, but not at this point. OK, cool. Well. Um, Ray, anything? Uh, just writing blogs and uh, the Layer 8 conference in June. Ah, and I heard speaking. that will probably also be uh, transferred to uh, virtual, right? I would imagine so, yes. Yeah, OK. Sector, you have anything to promote or shout out? Um, even though I'm busy with work, still pumping out a week in OSINT, um, I'm finally getting back to writing a very lengthy article about um, chronolocation and that will also include lots of information that you can find in Nick's Intel's latest blog, but then purely about date and timestamps. Um, and I do have the uh, solution for Techniset. You should start a blog because what you can do if you ever f are looking for a link you just Google dork your own blog like I have to do multiple times a week. Dude, I got over 1,300 links in there, so I have to write a lot of blogs. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty awesome. Uh, Nix, you got anything to promote? Yeah, I just finished recording a 10-minute tip, which will go on the OK Ocean Curious YouTube channel, hopefully, in the next couple of weeks, and that will be looking at Snapchat and Snapchat Map. So stay Ooh. tuned for that. 
looking forward about that. And lastly, but not like not least, MW. No, I'll just be adding random gifts to people's Twitter feed. So that's that's yes. what I'm going to be busy with the next gift week. wars. I love it. <laughs> well, uh, that's it for this week on the Ocean Curious podcast webcast. I was your host, and I'm still your host, Nico Dutch Ocean Guy, and I hope to see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. 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 See ya.